Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, this is one of the courses of the NPTEL Massive Online Open Courses. This course is on phonetics and phonology and uh, it is a broad overview of phonetics and phonology. So, um, this course deals with all the major aspects of phonetics and phonology and phonetics and phonology are two branches within linguistics which focus on speech sounds, linguistic sounds and both are derived from the word phone that is sound. And as we have already discussed in the introduction, uh, these are all the components of this course. We will talk about the human speech apparatus, we will talk about the sounds of the world's languages, the variety that we see across different uh, groups of languages and we will also discuss in great detail about the properties of sounds and also give you a basic overview of speech perception. and. Uh, also talk about phonology which is about identifying phonemes, phonological analysis and we will talk about phonetics, phonemics and phonological rules and also talk about diversity in terms of tone languages and also uh, one of the uh, components of speech that is intonation will also um, touch on uh, the prosodic aspects of sounds and this is your first class on uh, consonant production and we will also give you an overview of sounds before we delve into consonant production. So, um, linguistics as a discipline puts a lot of emphasis on uh, spoken language. It is the most important and primary form of communication for humans, uh, but does it deserve such intense scientific inquiry is a question and a research shows that speaking involves a wide array of intricate mental abilities and writing systems are only about 5000 years old and they also do not reflect the speech changes from generation to generation. Most of the world's languages do not have a writing system and children learn to speak first and reading and writing comes much later. Also. Uh, it is important to remember that an individual sound refers uh, to a stable portion of sound energy in a spoken language. Uh, for instance, in a monosyllabic word like no or do, we can think of two relatively stable portions of a sound. Okay, that much is pretty clear and transparent. And uh, however, it may not be always so. And this is reflected in the English writing system uh, also. And in no and do for instance or so, you can see two alphabets. Firstly, in connected speech, uh, the words may not stand out so clearly. And also, uh, it is important to maintain the distinction between the writing system and sounds because the relationship may be obscured by various irregularities in the sound to alphabet mapping. And when we are talking about English, it is important to remember that the English spelling system is quite irregular in representing sounds. So, uh, what we had uh, said a minute before that writing systems are only about 5000 years old and they do not reflect speech changes from generation to generation is important to bear in mind when we come across some irregularities like that in English. because um, that may also be a result of speech change and sound change from uh, one generation to another generation. And most of the world's languages also remember that most of the world's languages do not have a writing system and also children learn to speak first. Okay. Now, coming to irregularities, you know, here is a, 
um, tweet that I thought you might find interesting um, to follow because um, look at what is being written there that yes English can be weird it can be understood through tough thorough thought though. So what is noticeable here is that we are repeating a combination of two consonants. So the two consonants which are uh, repeated in all the words is G and H and when you go from one word to another and you see true and tough so in here G H is not is silent and in tough it is pronounced as F in thorough again it is um, silent and in thought again it is silent and in though again it is silent. So we can see the inconsistency here and when you when you think of uh, G and H together you think of other sounds you do not ever think of uh, or you do not ever think of silence. So this is something we encounter almost on a daily basis when if we know how to read and write in English and this was just to uh, point towards uh, something that you may one day suddenly realize that this is very inconsistent although when you are learning the language you have to learn the spelling system um, without um, thinking of the regularities and irregularities so much. And again uh, continuing with our um, GH um, sound combination uh, this is again attributed to uh, various uh, people this particular saying that if the GH sound in enough is produced for and the O in women makes the short E sound and the T in nation is pronounced as SH then the word GHOTI is pronounced just like fish that is if you take all these irregular pronunciations of GHOTI then you might end up in this uh, correlation where uh, GH is F O is um, equivalent to E as in I um, the, the, the sound E and um, TI is equivalent to SH. So this is again another humorous take on the irregularities present in the English language where you can see that GH is sometimes F and O is sometimes C e and TI is SH and of course the English spelling system is not going to change like this it is only a humorous way of looking at the irregularities. So uh, coming back now to how to represent uh, sounds of the world's languages we can talk about um, we c not just English but we can think about all the other languages of the world and we have mentioned in our first slide that um, many languages in the world do not have a writing system. How do we understand what the sounds of those languages are? So linguists use an internationally approved system of transcription in which each symbol represent a particular sound irrespective of the languages and it contains many symbols to represent the diversity across languages. The system is called the International Phonetic Alphabet and it first came into being in 1886 and has been modified regularly to include new discoveries in the sound inventories of the languages of the world. So now you understand that linguists um, have a way of representing the variety of sounds in the world's languages which we may not encounter in the most commonly spoken languages and th the sounds in those languages which are distinctive have to be represented and we have to understand what is their um, manner of articulation and what systems or what processes are involved in those um, in the production of those sounds. So uh, linguists need a system of writing down or transcribing the sounds of all languages in the world using symbols which are similar to writing systems but different because they have to be consistent and regular across languages. So this system of writing down or transcribing the sounds of all languages in the world using symbols which are similar to writing systems but different. So they are both similar and different and you will um, see that in a second. So this is what the International Phonetic 
alphabet is, this is how it looks like and I will draw your attention to the consonant inventory of the world's languages. You will see some very familiar symbols for instance, pub here, tud here, kug here and also n, r um, and m and others are from the mostly Roman but you can see some Greek. Uh, so, you can see th and the and you can also see p and v and uh, these are symbols which represent particular ways of production of consonants which you will learn gradually in this course. And as you move forward, you will see that there are of course others which are vaguely familiar but not quite and there are slight differences between this v and this one written slightly differently, not written representing different sounds and the alphabets, uh, the, the symbols are very important, their appropriate replication is very important because they stand for specific consonants. And another important thing that you may notice here is that where you see pairs of sounds, the one on the right hand side uh, indicate the, the voice sound. And in this uh, alphabet you see also sounds which are produced using the non-pulmonic airstream and which we will talk about in great detail when you study the sounds, different sounds of the world's languages and uh, you also see the vowel inventory, you see this a very precise um, sort of a, a diagram here where vowels are in pairs and we will talk about this diagram, why do we represent vowels in this way and why do we have uh, pairs of vowels here, why these symbols are here, why these symbols are here, the reasons as to why the symbols appear in the places that they do in the vowel chart. It is supposed to represent the place inside the mouth, inside the vocal tract where the vowels are, are produced. So, this is a very precise diagram and it shows you know, very precise locations and of course, these are called this what we know and what we understand as the cardinal vowels, so the most basic vowels and of course, um, as we produce the vowels, there are various changes from the cardinal set that is assumed in the vowel inventory. And then we have other symbols, diacritics uh, which uh, indicate different um, nuances of the consonants and vowels, voicelessness, aspiration roundedness and lingual labial, we will study what lingual labial sounds are, labialized, palatalized, velarized sounds, etc. And also uh, suprasegmental prosodic aspects, so stress and uh, length and syllable breaks and tones and accents, etc. are represented in this international phonetic alphabet which tries to be as rigorous, as much representative as possible of all the languages of the world. So, that is the international phonetic alphabet. If you want to see the IPH chart with sounds, there is this link that you can make use of. If you click on the individual sounds, then you hear the way that they are produced and following this link. So, Consonant symbols in the uh, International Phonetic Alphabet chart correspond to Roman letters and represent the usual value. So, you have seen these um, symbols and they are as you can imagine, they are um, what we produced them as in the Roman letters. So, this is sir and this is fur, this is her and then we have others which are not used in the Roman alphabet. So, like this one which is it stands for the voiceless dental fricative th and this one which stands for the voiced dental fricative. So, each individual speech sound corresponds to a unique symbol and each symbol to a sound and a sequence of sounds must be represented as a sequence of symbols. So, every word will be uh, represented as a sequence of symbols. So, sh, z, for instance, the sounds sh, z have their own symbols and slightly the sh, sh is, is this long sh and, and z is a curly. So, what are these sounds? Sh is as in nation, sh 
and measure this one is j. So ng singer does not have a ng uh, sequence uh, phonetically. It is a single uh, consonant sound and uh, similar to ng, but with the back of the tongue in the position of g. So we would represent singer like this because this is the consonant used there. And then church and judge, they are actually not single consonants at all. They are t plus sh and the plus j in this particular. So these are called affricates. We will uh, learn more about specific articulation of these different types of sounds in our following classes, in our following lectures and for the time being it is uh, good enough to know how each symbol is uh, pronounced. So we have these affricates ch, j and then we have the inverted r which is as in the English r and then we have y. Y um, represents the sound usually uh, which is in English y or as in suppose the word yam, um, yam. But then the, what we see in English as in Roman j, uh, this is as in juice, juice, this is the symbol for juice and for j, the j in juice, j in juice is not this. So uh, this and the way it appears in English as in j and the rest symbol represented by this uh, by this symbol they are not the same. So, in English alphabet system this represents j and not not y as in this is the ipa and um, this this j is English and this y is in ipa. And uh, the number of letters in the alphabet may not be indicative of the sound. So, uh, there are many instances like that and we have um, many examples. For instance, if we take words like island, uh, the S is not pronounced there or isle, the S is not pronounced there and there are many such examples or as in knowledge. The K is not pronounced there. So, the number of letters in the alphabet may not be indicative of the sound and may be completely um, silent or may be pronounced differently uh, from word to word. And G, this symbol is always pronounced uh, as a hard as in G, as in get or bag, but never um, as in gem or age. So, this symbol stands for the G that we get in get or bag and not j as in gem or age that is still what we uh, in gem or age it is this symbol j whereas in g it is as in get or bag. And uh, when you are talking about number of letters in the alphabet may not be indicative of the sound we talked about how we may have silent um, letters. And we can also have uh, two sounds in the English orthography. We may have one uh, alphabet as in box X, it represents two sounds K and S. So, the extra letters used in the, the symbols used in IPA denote different sounds not found among the basic sounds of English. So, the extra sounds are these like um, this N and the sh and j and th and the. So, these are extra sounds and there are many more extra sounds that are not found in the basic sounds of English. So, what we will see in the IP alphabet is not just what you find in English, but also a uh, few symbols apart from what you find in English. Uh, the vowels also require a lot of careful study uh, and the symbols are less familiar and even the familiar symbols generally do not have the phonetic values we think that they would have and the sounds you produce are determined by our lips, teeth, tongue and other vocal organs and every sound has sounds that are distinct from 
each other. So, to talk about uh, sound production, which we will shortly uh, will discuss consonant production, uh, we have to remember that uh, the sounds are produced by the specific combination of the lips, teeth, tongue in our vocal tract. And every language has sounds that are distinct from each other. So, that would basically make the inventory of sounds and, and you need an inventory of sounds of consonants and vowels. So, that to maximize the number of words in the language and which will constitute its vocabulary, the lexicon that is required to uh, make the sentences of the language. And uh, while uh, sounds, while production of sounds may seem quite easy, there are a lot of complicated um, mechanisms involved there of and um, however, in the production we have to make uh, sounds are in such a way that they ultimately have some amount of articulatory ease and and in the production, the way that the, the hearer will hear those sounds, there has to be some auditory distinctiveness. And even though the words that we um, want to produce seem to come out magically out of our mouth and um, they are, there are many complex mechanisms involved and uh, when we finally produce the sounds, uh, the words, uh, sounds that make up the words and that is heard by a listener and made sense of. They are complicated mechanisms involved of uh, uh, right from the articulation till the part of perception and also comprehension of those sounds. So, hence um, one of the important things while we study sounds is also how brains organize and help in memorizing sounds. And a sufficient number of vowels and consonants are required to form words which are distinct from each other. And uh, mostly the sounds in a language form a pattern. If a language um, has a sound p, it may also have b and m and if it has t, it may also have d and n. So, their uh, linguists have studied patterns in languages. So, if one language has this sound, we may also find the other sound. So, so if a language has um, b, it may also have p, it may have the labial uh, it may also have b and m. If a language has um, t, it may have the other alveolar sounds, the and n, they are pretty uh, close as we will see, as you will see when we learn more and more about consonant production. And all this understanding is, is to help us more about the process of how the brains organize and help in memorizing these sounds. And despite plenty of variations, the sounds that all languages use have um, many features in common. And the commonality is that all languages will have vowels and consonants. So, it will make up the words of the language and it is not possible to have anything else other than vowels and consonants. And also, almost all languages use the pulmonic air stream that is the air pushed out of the lungs to make these vowels and consonants. We will see that apart from the pulmonic air stream, the glottalic and velaric air stream uh, mechanisms are also used by languages, but not all sounds are produced by the glottalic and velaric air streams because um, uh, they are sort of the more difficult sounds produced and most of the other sounds are produced with the pulmonic air stream. And change in um, pitch for intonation that is also supposed to be another feature which is uh, there across languages of course to um, different extents because uh, tone languages may have lesser intonation um, and other languages may have more intonation. But then generally to um, ask questions versus statements most languages will make the use of will make use of pitch distinctions to uh, encode those differences. Now that we have uh, an overview of uh, sounds, how they are represented by linguists with the um, international phonetic alphabet that the international phonetic alphabet has symbols which may be unfamiliar to you because they are, they are representative of sounds in different languages. Some may be familiar um, from your um, acquaintance with the Roman alphabet system, but some others may not be so familiar. But you have to remember that this is meant for uh, the different languages of the world and as we know 
there are about six to seven thousand languages in the world. So, uh, coming back to our main uh, topic of uh, this course, phonetics and phonology. Phonetics deals with the production of speech sounds by humans, various aspects of their physical and measurable properties. And phonology is about sound patterns, especially different patterns of sounds in uh, different languages or within each language. It also deals with the mental organization of sounds and sound patterns. So, uh, what is phonology study? Let us take something that we just talked about pattern. So, what uh, pattern? So, let us talk about consonant cluster. A word can start with str in English, but not with ftr and um, of course, it starts with tr, uh, it starts with tr, it ta starts with str, but not with uh, ftr and not with uh, esh, esh tr either, not uh, sutter either. Okay. So, words can start with pl, pr, tr, but not with t, l. So, um, tr is possible. A PR is possible and a DR is possible, but a TL is not possible, PL is possible and a DL is not possible. Similarly, BR is possible, BL is also possible. So, some are not possible, some are possible when we talk about constant clusters. Why does this happen? So, why will we not get uh, words in English which starts with tr but not with tl or starts with pr and pl and dr and but not with dl, but both br and bl are possible. So, what makes these patterns possible? And similarly, uh, with regard to uh, aspiration, aspiration in English is not contrastive and whereas in other languages it is contrastive. So, there are aspiration rules in English. So, the word initially in stress position uh, we have aspiration in English, but in other languages those rules do not apply because they are words which are meaningful based on uh, the difference in aspiration. Also, we can study uh, in phonology, we can understand in greater detail as to why some changes happen in uh, languages when words are borrowed from one language to another language. So, we can see that suppose uh, we take these uh, Japanese examples, very simple ones. Um, if we take the example of chewing gum, which is called um, gamu or camera, which remains camera, and but once we move to glass, we see a massive change there, la changes to ra, and then we insert a final u. And again, more changes as we move on uh, to calendar. So, if we see, uh, we see here that l is uh, r and the final consonant is deleted and more uh, complicated as we move on to television. So, a part of this entire word is not there. So, it is called terabi and again l changes to r and v changes to b and then a hotel is um, hoteru and resotoran stands for restaurant and uh, machi stands for match and mission for uh, sewing machine and ruru for rules. So, something that we see consistently is the change of uh, le to ra. Okay. So, um, le goes to ra in Japanese loan words borrowed from English and we see that they very much become like Japanese words and not English words anymore and only the uh, meaning uh, is derived from the English uh, lexicon. So, why do these changes happen? So, what is there in the phonology of uh, Japanese that, that changes the English uh, word into something um, Japanese? So, that is the uh, we would study this in terms of how the Japanese phonology uh, influences uh, the words which are borrowed from English to make them have their specific uh, phonological uh, shape. And as we go on to study uh, speech production uh, from phonology, from phonology where we saw uh, you got a glimpse of phonology that is uh, we saw patterns, 
we try to understand why certain changes will happen if one phonology takes over and new words are borrowed into uh, another language, say Japanese. And also you saw how uh, some clusters for instance in English are not possible and we studied those kind of uh, organization in the um, mental organization of sounds. So that is the phonology. And when we move on to speech production, we study more of phonetics. So to produce speech, air must flow from the lungs through the vocal tract and the vocal folds or the nose or uh, nasal cavity and the mouth or oral cavity. And uh, vocal folds uh, vibration produce uh, voicing uh, for, uh, for some sounds and air releases through the nose for certain sounds which are nasal or nasalized. Now these are your um, ability of speech production which um, gives the specific sounds the specific qualities for instance nasal sounds. So air releases through the nose and that is why you get a nasal or nasalized sound. And um, vocal fold vibration is important for the distinction between voice and voiceless sound. And uh, this is what you would study in speech production and, and understand how the different distinctions between the sounds in terms of the production is brought about. So from there we, s we understand that phonetics must be about speech production. So a speech production is not just about passing the air through the nasal cavity or the specific uh, production of uh, vowels versus consonants. It's, it involves um, many, many uh, different uh, complexities. So first is articulatory ph phonetics where you would study the production as we just saw and articulation can be also studied with various tools nowadays with uh, ultrasound etc. And from the imagings you can understand articulation in great de detail with not just the movement of the articulators in, in terms of the description but also measure and see visually and also get the images of our articulators and understand in great detail um, in minute detail as to what happens when we are producing the sounds. Now uh, then there is acoustic phonetics where also we study and obviously um, a speech but here we uh, look at not just uh, the articulation but also the properties, the acoustics that is also how um, the fundamental frequency or the amplitude or duration etc. are different in the uh, sounds that we produce and apart from that we also can study more, um, we can conduct um, more advanced studies uh, apart from just the fundamental frequency or the amplitude with uh, many tools which are available to us and we can study all aspects of phonation and the changes in the, in the uh, F0 and um, what particular uh, changes involve uh, which particular sound and how one sound is different from the other based on the acoustics. So while articulatory phonetics will tell you about the articulation acoustics will tell you about uh, those uh, acoustic properties and all of these can be studied with the use of technology. Auditory phonetics is about how we hear sounds, the audition aspect of it and um, partially also uh, speech perception um, is a part of um, phonetics and can be studied as part of acoustic phonetics and auditory phonetics as well. And um, articulation, now when we move to articulatory phonetics, um, there are some of the basic, these are some of the very basic things uh, that we will study in articulation. And remember that we will study not just articulatory phonetics, we will study even acoustic phonetics in quite a bit of detail in this course. So we now start with articulation, we will let us have a look at just the very basic aspects of articulation. So we classify consonants according to the following characteristics, vocal fold vibration which gives you voice saying differences and then manner of articulation where you have the occlusion or 
um, what kind of constriction inclusion that you have in the production of consonants. And the place of articulation is of course uh, the place where the occlusion or the constriction happens inside the mouth and also uh, other aspects like airflow through the nasal cavity, lip rounding uh, etc. which gives particular um, a shade to the different sounds that we are producing and all these aspects are a part of articulation. So, now we have to understand a bit about the basic units of sound as we move on to study uh, articulation and uh, sounds and speech sounds in greater detail. Now we have to understand this because we have to know what we are studying. Okay, we are studying about sounds, but can we just take a, a, a string of sounds and try to understand them? No, but we have to know what in the sound that we are trying to uh, understand. If we think about that, um, uh, if we think about looking at sound in a structured way, then we have to think about the smallest unit. So, the, the unit that we are targeting to understand would be the smallest unit. And the smallest unit of language which distinguishes meaning, we would call that the basic organizational unit of phonology and also in phonetics is termed the phoneme. Okay. So, the smallest unit which distinguishes meaning and most of the time uh, phonemes are uh, shown with brackets slash forward uh, brackets and inside uh, that you represent the sound and that is the phoneme. So, uh, the distribution of phonemes in English is fairly systematic and the consonants appear in voiced and voiceless members and the vowels in sets of long and short vowels. So, that you had seen that the consonants appeared in voiced and voiceless members when you saw the uh, international phonetic alphabet chart. So, ta, the ka, ga, voiceless, voice, voiceless, voice, vowels uh, short, long and also vowels uh, in the vowel chart will be represented with uh, as rounded and unrounded sets. Uh, we are still continuing with understanding phoneme which is we call the basic organizational uh, unit, the smallest unit. Uh, it is possible to distinguish phonemes that not just in the way they are pronounced, but also um, in their uh, relative strength. So, what do we mean by that? The relative strength here is it means that consonants would be different in the way that they pron pronounce. So, some consonants would be longer so that when the consonant release happens a bit later. So, the strength is uh, different there from a singleton consonant. Long consonants are indicated in transcription by doubling the consonant in question. Vowels um, is shown by placing a length mark. So, why we are talking about this is that phonemes can be just singleton or can also be lengthened and that is also a feature of uh, some languages. Okay, now that we have understood a bit about phoneme as an organizational unit, as a smallest uh, um, uh, unit of representation, let us also see if there are other units of sounds that we need to know about. Uh, yes, there are other units of sounds that we need to know about and uh, they are called phones and allophones. So, what is an allophone? In a language, there will be sounds which are used to differentiate meaning and those which do not serve that function. So, which means there will be some sounds in languages which hearers will not even know that they are pronouncing that sound differently from the distinctive sound that they are uh, supposed to pronounce. So, and why does that happen? That happens mostly because of environment, of the environment in which that sound occurs. And when an environment changes a sound and makes it slightly different from its basic sound, then that sound is called an allophone. Now, this might be a bit confusing for you at this moment, but as we go along and we study more and more about sounds, you will understand what this means. And uh, another important term which is also used in uh, understanding sounds is that is called is called phone. So, uh, what is a phone? Uh, this is the smallest uh, unit of human sound which is uh, recognizable but not 
uh, classified. And um, it is not classified in the sense it is not a phoneme, it is not the basic distinctive underlying sound, abstract sound, it is the sound which occurs on the surface and it is the one that you, um, that you recognize, uh, that you identify, but it is not which is, uh, it is not the one which probably the speaker stores um, it in his mind or the underlying sound from which all the other changes happens. So, this is generally any sound can be um, called a phone if it is uh, not an allophone and if it is not the underlying distinctive sound. So, we will um, talk more about these distinctions as we uh, move along. We will study first we will study uh, in phonetics how sounds are produced and the acoustic properties of the sounds about the uh, different sounds in the languages of the world and then we will move on to phonology where we will study all these aspects of how sounds change in a given environment and um, uh, a lot more about how morphology changes those uh, sounds in, in various contexts. So, briefly a word about uh, allophone. Allophone uh, concerns itself with the realization of a phoneme. So, um, a phoneme may be realized in uh, different ways. A phoneme is the underlying distinctive sound, uh, the one that is the minimal unit of organization, but its realization may be different. The phoneme is a unit in the sound system of a language and this means that it is an abstract unit. So, uh, while the phoneme is an abstract unit, the other sounds which appear on the surface have different names, for instance, an allophone, and that is why the allophone is non distinctive. It cannot be distinctive because it will always, um, it will have a, sh its, its shape will be determined by the environment because the different pronunciations do not realize a difference in meaning. And in English, there is no contrast between uh, ter and ther. Why is there no contrast between in English between ter and ther? Because um, ter and ther will not make different words with different meanings in English. So, in ther will appear as uh, the sound of as the let us say as the sound which uh, appears on behalf of the whenever there is a certain environment. Suppose the environment is that this is word initial as in the word tip. So, uh, on behalf of the th will appear because um, this position governs the shape of the and makes it th. Okay. So, allophones are supposed to be in complementary distribution and this is an important aspect of phonemic analysis which we will study when we will look at phonology and um, complementary distribution because in this position it will be th and however, so th is an allophone of the underlying th, but when it comes to the for instance, suppose there are two words. Uh, and there are two words in English, tip and dip. Tip and dip, the and the can uh, occur in the same position in the initial part of a word and they can mean two different things. They do mean two different things, they are completely different words. But that does not apply in case of the and the because um, tip is just the way you pronounce it, the underlying the. And, uh, and this is called contrastive distribution, this is called complementary distribution. Basically, ter, ter is appearing as the sound of ter in that particular environment and that is why it is complementary distribution, whereas this is contrastive because the occurrence of uh, the in this position instead of ter will make a completely different word. So, to understand sounds that is important to know that sounds can be distinctive, all the distinctive sounds in the language make up the phonemic inventory of that language and all the different um, articulations, all the different um, changes given the environment is uh, those changes uh, do not, those different sounds produced because of the environment do not constitute the phonemic inventory of 
that language and that's very important to understand that's why the phonemic inventory is much smaller and all the allophones of uh, the different phonemes um, can be uh, very many. Given that we have now had a brief introduction to what the sound is, what we are looking at when we are looking at speech production, that is we are looking at how phonemes are pronounced, pro produced and the environment will lead to a lot of changes in the phonemes and there will be allophones and the surface um, production of the phonemes will be quite different, there will be allophones. The ones which you see on the surface will be called phones, they will not be the phonemes. And um, speech sounds are the result of movements of parts of the vocal tract, particularly the lips, tongue tip, ting tongue body and larynx, uh, which obstruct the f air flowing out of the lungs. And consonants are produced by a certain degree of obstruction of the airstream coming from the lungs. Whereas in vowels, the mouth remains relatively open and therefore uh, there is a fundamental difference between the production of consonants and production of vowels. Consonants involve occlusion, vowels involve um, the mouth remaining relatively open for the production of vowels that is almost important that vowels will be produced when the mouth is open and consonants will, will involve some degree of occlusion, either the occlusion is going to be very um, rigid or it is going to be less so. Uh, we can describe types of consonants in terms of how much obstruction is involved and that is called the manner of articulation. Another important aspect which we will look at a lot in this course is airstream mechanism and the shaded area there is the part which is involved, the airstream mechanism, the air pushed out from that part involves that organ. So, we have the pulmonic airstream mechanism where lungs are involved, the lungs push out the air which is uh, given shape to by the vocal tract and the glottal region. And then uh, here the shaded region is the glottalic region, the air trapped in the glottalic region can also produce sounds which are called glottalic. And then we also have velaric sounds, so air in the velaric region will produce those sounds. So, we have aggressive sounds uh, as pulmonic aggressive, most sounds in the languages of the world are produced with the pulmonic aggressive airstream air coming out and the aggressive uh, it can produce only in the glottalic and velaric airstreams, the glottalic um, aggressives are called ejectives, the ingressives are called which is ingressives are produced with the air, not the air which is coming out but the air sucked in and those are called implosives and we have uh, ingressive sounds produced by the velaric airstream uh, and those are called clicks. We will look at these sounds in great detail when we look at the different diversity in the languages of the world. And then we have the um, consonant production which involves the different places in the mouth, the alveolar ridge, the palate and um, the velum and then we have the tongue which is the active articulator, the epiglottis and the larynx and then we have uh, different uh, consonants based on manner of articulation where there is complete obstruction and then we have stops and full release, we have stops, we have nasals also which can be stops when the velum is lowered and then the air flows through the velopharyngeal port and out of the nose and then we have nasals. We have fricatives where we have partial construction, constriction in the mouth such that air is pushed out of the narrow passage creating a hissing sound. And we have affricates which um, is a, a combination of stop plus fricative sequences where we have complete obstruction and then slow release like a fricative. And then we have approximants where we have very little occlusion uh, and then but definitely more than vowels. And then we have in approximants, we have the lateral approximant. So, we have stops which are produced um, with complete obstruction, sudden release. We have nasals where air is released through the velopharyngeal port. We can have trills like this, we do not have um, a narrow occlusion, but we have that repeating pattern. We have taps or flaps with less rapid occlusion there and then fricatives we have the, the occlusion is not as uh, rigid as that of the stop 
and then we have approximants. Also, we have to talk about place of articulation of bilabials, labiodentals, dentals, velars, post alveolars, and these are all the places of articulation which we will look at in the um, next lecture. We will wrap up today's class with um, today's lecture with um, a bit about voicing. Voicing is uh, occurs when you have vocal fold vibration and you can see that here this is the vocal folds which are vibrating producing voice sound and this is the voiceless. So, and what is the difference between um, voiceless and voicing? So, when you produce a make a sound like v or z and you can uh, produce that v or z and you can uh, continue up to count of 5 and contrast that with force and then you will see that when you are producing v or z you have a vibration and this buzz is created by the voicing of your vocal folds and that is voicing sounds produced with the vibrating vocal folds are said to be voiced and those produced without the vocal fold are voiceless. So, in voiceless sounds the glottis is more open and so that air passes through without vibrating. That brings us to the end of today's lecture. We have looked at a lot of things today about sound production, about the representation of sounds, about phonemes, allophones and also a bit about consonant production, manner of articulation, place of articulation and voicing. That brings us to today's lecture, to the end of today's lecture and in the next lecture we will look at uh, sound production, consonant production in greater detail. Thank you for your attention.